Um, you have to start with the Chief Risk Officer's um, Charter of Responsibilities. Um, if the Risk Committee is expecting direct access to the CRO, you have to um, clarify what you mean by that. You know, is that uh, is that no more than at the end of a, of a committee meeting, a private session between the non-executive members of the Risk Committee and the CRO? So, i.e., if you have the CFO or the CEO on the Risk Committee, just like the Audit Committee, they will leave the room, and the CRO will have the opportunity to have a private conversation with the, with the committee. Uh, that can be one form it takes. Do you mean that the CRO uh, will have some sort of reporting line where the committee or the chair of the committee can commission work for the CRO, which comes to them, and that the CEO and the CFO do not see it before it comes to the committee? It can take many forms, this reporting uh, relationship. I think what Walker envisaged um, in a slightly simplistic way was under certain circumstances, i.e., you know, um, and I think what he was thinking of was Royal Bank of Scotland. You know, the CEO wants to do an acquisition which is very, very risky. The CRO should be able to come to the non-execs and express their concern about this. And I think that's what Walker had in mind of the executive team in that regard. So it can take many forms, and that CRO relationship to the risk committee really does need to be explicitly agreed on, and not something that people discover is, is, is actually happening. And it can, can uh, it can take many many different forms depending on the requirements of, of, of non uh, The the next area I think to touch on is the actual uh, role and responsibility of the chair of the risk committee. Now, what Walker is trying to do, and by default the FSA, because in um, their CP I think it's three of ten, wasn't it? I think. Um, they took the easy way out and basically said, well, Walker talks about banks and large life companies, but we think the Walker report should apply to everybody who, who regulate. Um, which, one of, which was one of their less helpful um, implementation approaches, because you wouldn't want to apply Walker to you know, a small limit syndicate or, or, or so on. And actually, there's a lot of people in the London market, subject to other jurisdictions, you know, whether it's Bermuda, whether it's Swiss, whether it's the USA, and, and so on. Um, but once you have a risk committee and you have a chair of a risk committee, you then have a role to define. And certainly, um, uh, I, it's, it's interesting that um, the smart chairs of risk committees are very, very careful about what their role is. If you're the chair of an audit committee, it's very, very clear what your, your, what your role is, and you can turn to... Uh, London Stock Exchange or US Stock Exchange requirements and actually see a very, very clear clear role. And it has a long track record, so you have a lot of precedent and you can look at how other people's audit committees are functioning and so on. When something's new, it's very easy, I find, for the basics to be ignored and the rush to get something established. And in some cases, to give you an example, the chair of the risk committee um, is spending almost as much time as the chair of an audit committee. There's a big um, change going on, whereas before, if you were the chair of an audit committee, well, if you were a non-executive director of, say, a quality company with quarterly board meetings, you might be spending a dozen days a year on that company's business in a steady state. Uh, that's increasing to between 20 and 30. For large banks, um, non-execs are probably looking at 50 plus and certainly if you were chair of the audit committee or the risk committee you'd be looking at 100 days plus um, so there's quite a big change now once you have the chair of an audit committee spending anything i would suggest between 30 and 100 days that started to become quite a full-time job um, and that then starts to get into a much much wider remit than just agreeing the agenda and chairing meetings and so on. And certainly the intention behind Walker was far more active oversight by non-execs of risk-taking decisions. And you know his conclusion, as a number of you will know, from his, his review of the last couple of years, um, was that essentially it was to do with a failure of corporate governance and a failure of non-executives and leading shareholders to 
uh, to exercise enough oversight over, over management. I mean, I'm not sure I agree with that diagnosis, and I think it's, it's simplistic and, uh, to a certain extent, um, reflecting some of the politics which are, which are you know, now going on. Uh, but nevertheless, it's certainly a valid set of, of, of causes. So once you start having the chair of a risk committee thinking, well, I'm going to spend 50 to 100 days on this company's risk matters, you need to be very, very clear you all know what they think they're going to be doing and how you're going to start serving them. Because as a non-exec, the, you know, the thing you notice in moving from an executive role is lack of information. You know, if you're an executive, you can go and create information, you can go and get information. As a non-executive, all you can do is ask. And you find lots of ways of asking, <laughs> but that's all you can do. So, you know, increasing the time allocation of a non-exec directly translates into executives having to serve that non-exec's information request. The, the next area, um, <coughs> which we've touched on initially, but I want to come back to, is really executive versus non-executive risk committees. Uh, I think it's increasingly difficult and it will be very difficult for an executive team to show compliance with uh, Pillar 2 without some internal executive committees very focused on risk issues. Now, given Pillar 2 is all about your, your having an adequate system of governance, um, you know, once you've got a medium-sized insurance operation you know, operating under multiple jurisdictions across multiple product lines, how are you going to show that an executive team is spending enough time considering risk issues? I think it becomes quite difficult to, to actually do that. So we're already seeing, now they're not always called risk committees, they can be called capital committees, capital allocation committees, finance and risk committees. Um, but I do think it will be difficult under Pillar 2 um, but if you haven't got a, an executive body with a charter that actually talks about you know, uh, setting risk appetite, reviewing actual appetite, um, uh, looking at emerging issues. And don't forget one of the very interesting things in Walker, which he highlighted to his credit, was the difference between backward looking and forward looking. And again, one of his findings was that in the large banks, they had pretty good backward-looking risk governance, typically around um, either audit committees, <coughs> um, treasury committees, asset liability management committees, and so on. What they lacked pretty dramatically was anything forward-looking. So again, I think from an executive point of view, how are you going to say, here is a group of people with sufficient expertise, power, seniority, and time who are actually looking forward at future risk issues and how do they affect current and prospective risk appetite. Now, you might be able to carve out enough time on executive agenda, and ideally that would be the best place to do it, but I think that would be difficult you know, with all the other business issues you have to, to show. The, the final one I wanted to talk about um, in terms of what are the key issues you have to address is leadership in crisis situations. What happens? if you set up governance in a period of calm or following a crisis. It runs along very nicely, everybody thinks they know the rules because no one's testing the rules and you then have a crisis. You, know, you either have um, some industry-wide loss like a huge hurricane or a huge earthquake or um, you have a very, very company-specific crisis. Uh, you, know, you have some road underwriting, um, you have uh, you get embroiled in, you know, the SEC going after you for some finite reinsurance you've been buying, and so on. And what happens in that crisis situation is all the weaknesses in your risk governance and corporate governance that you never dealt with properly when you were setting up a CRO or you were changing a CRO's role or you were bringing in an executive or a board risk committee suddenly spring up. And instead of being able to focus on the crisis in a situation where everybody knows what their roles are, you're suddenly into a whole corporate governance and people acting 
out of authority and all sorts of interpersonal issues fly up and that is the last thing you actually need when you're trying to deal with an angry regulator or a very difficult US shareholder and you're having an argument about when you shouldn't be doing this. The board saying, well, why wasn't this referred to us? And this is where all the issues I've talked about before suddenly uh, explode in your face. <coughs> you know, what's the risk committee doing? Why wasn't the board consulted about this? You know, what's the chief executive think he's doing? You know, you know, and you start having the executives going, well, why is the CRO telling the board this? We've not, you know, we've not resolved the issue. So you have to be very, very clear that you've actually got very solid relationships and mandates established. But then also, I think specifically, say, in a crisis situation, and you know, there's a very good medical definition of a crisis, which is it's, it's a problem people haven't got solutions to, <laughs> uh, which then provokes all sorts of, 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 of unusual behaviours and quite rational normals with the chairman of the companies, you know, uh, become these very, very difficult uh, creatures in, 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 in a crisis. You have to be, I think, very explicitly, uh, typically through a paper to the risk committee and the board, say, right, this is our definition of a, of a crisis. These are the really bad things that can happen. And this is how we see you all playing, playing a different role role. And typically, what I've noticed with the few crises I've been involved in, is the problem is one of information, not the fact that something has gone wrong. Most non-execs, in fact, maybe all non-execs in my experience, are sufficiently experienced and grown up to know that things will go wrong. It's usually executive teams who just don't believe things that can go wrong. Most non-execs have seen enough things go wrong in their lives that they don't believe it when an executive team keeps telling them everything's all right. Because you know, insurance is not like that, as we all we all know. The very important thing is for people to know when think when are they going to be informed. Because as a non-exec, the thing that always worries me is are you being told what's happening, both good and bad? And are you being given confidence that the executive team are dealing with this? Because if they're dealing it, that's absolutely fine. If they're not dealing with it, then I've got a problem because I'm starting to get personally exposed to it. I think what needs to happen um, is there needs to be this dialogue between management, the board and the risk committee about in a crisis situation which we define as having these characteristics, these are the levels of reporting, this is what we're, we're going to happen. Typically, it's no more than ensuring that the chief executive in his weekly or fortnightly or monthly phone call to the non-execs is you know, giving them um, some, some level of assurance.